On September 1, 1974, Tamang climbed into the cockpit of the most advanced aircraft ever built and did exactly that. One hour and 54 minutes, that's all it took. They crossed the Atlantic Ocean in less time than it takes most people to watch a movie. But here's what makes this truly insane, that record still stands today. Fifty years later, with all our technology, all our advances, nobody has beaten it, not even close. This is the story of the SR-71 Blackbird, the plane that flew so fast it could outrun missiles, and the September day when it proved to the world that some legends are absolutely real. Let's go back to 1964, the height of the Cold War. America and the Soviet Union were locked in a technological arms race that pushed the boundaries of what seemed possible. The CIA needed something unprecedented, a spy plane that could photograph enemy territory from 70,000 feet up and fly so fast that nothing on Earth could touch it. Enter Clarence Kelly Johnson and his team at Lockheed Skunk Works. These weren't your typical engineers. They were the mavericks, the rule breakers, the people who got called in when the impossible needed to become possible. Johnson looked at the requirements and basically said, sure, we'll build you a plane that can fly at three times the speed of sound. No problem, except it was a massive problem. Everything about this aircraft defied conventional thinking. At Mach 3 speeds, the air friction would heat the plane's surface to over 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to melt aluminum, which is what most aircraft were made of. So they had to build it almost entirely out of titanium, a metal so difficult to work with that they had to invent new tools just to shape it. But here's where it gets wild. The SR-71 was designed to leak fuel on the ground. Yes, you heard that right. The panels and tanks were built with gaps because when the aircraft reached operating temperature at altitude, the metal would expand and seal itself. On the runway, JP-7 fuel would literally drip out onto the tarmac. The plane wasn't fully assembled until it was screaming through the stratosphere at Mach 3. The engines were another engineering miracle. The Pratt and Whitney J-58 engines could operate as both turbojets and ramjets seamlessly transitioning between the two modes. At maximum speed, 80% of the thrust came from the engine's bypass system, not the turbines. It was essentially breathing fire at supersonic speeds. And the shape that distinctive, predatory silhouette wasn't just for show. Every angle, every curve was calculated to minimize radar signature. This was stealth technology before the word stealth even existed in military aviation. When the SR-71 first flew in 1964, it was 10 years ahead of anything else in the sky. When it was finally retired in 1998, it was still 20 years ahead. Think about that, this aircraft remained cutting edge for over three decades. By September 1974, the SR-71 program was in full swing. These planes had been flying reconnaissance missions over hostile territory for years, photographing Soviet installations, tracking naval movements, mapping terrain with such precision that intelligence analysts could count individual vehicles from 14 miles up. But there was something else brewing, the Farnborough International Airshow, one of the most prestigious aviation events in the world, was scheduled in England. And the Air Force had an idea, what if we flew an SR-71 across the Atlantic and showed the world exactly what American engineering could do? This wasn't just about setting a speed record. This was a demonstration of power, a message that said, we have technology you can't even comprehend. It was the Cold War, after all. Every move was calculated, every display mattered. Major James Sullivan was chosen as pilot. Captain Noel Whittefield would serve as reconnaissance systems officer. Both men were experienced as our 71 crew members, but this flight was different. This wasn't a classified reconnaissance mission over enemy territory. This was going to be public, documented, the whole world would be watching. The route was straightforward on paper. Take off from Beale Air Force Base in California, fly to New York, then shoot across the Atlantic to London. But at Mach 3, 
straightforward doesn't mean simple. At those speeds, you're covering a mile every two seconds. Your turn radius is measured in states, not miles. You can't just point the nose where you want to go and push the throttle. Every movement has to be calculated minutes in advance. The cockpit instruments are and showing you where you are, they re showing you where you were several seconds ago. And then there's the refueling. The SR 71 couldn't make the journey on internal fuel alone. It would need to tank up from a KC 135Q tanker aircraft mid flight, twice, once near the East Coast, and once more over the Atlantic. Imagine trying to connect to aircraft flying at over 500 miles per hour. The tolerances are impossibly tight. The boom operator in the tanker has to guide a rigid refueling boom into a receptacle on the SR-71S spine while both aircraft scream through the sky. One mistake, one miscalculation, and the mission is over, or worse. September 1, 1974, the sun was barely up when Sullivan and Whittefield went through their pre-flight checks. The SR-71 wasn't a plane you just climbed into and fired up. It required a ritual, a precise sequence of steps that couldn't be rushed. First, the pressure suits. These weren't flight suits, they were essentially space suits. At 70,000 feet, the air pressure is so low that your blood would literally boil without protection. The suits were custom-fitted, connected to the aircraft's life support systems, and uncomfortable as hell. Pilots would often lose 10 pounds in sweat during a single mission. The engines roared to life with a sound that can only be described as controlled violence. It wasn't a roar or a scream, it was something deeper, more primal. The ground crews called it the Haba Howl, named after the venomous pit viper found in Okinawa where the SR-71s were stationed. Takeoff was relatively conventional, but once they cleared the California coast and headed east, Sullivan pushed the throttles forward. The acceleration was unlike anything in civilian aviation. The horizon didn't just move, it rushed toward you like a freight train. They hit their first refueling point near New York. The KC-135 tanker was already orbiting, waiting. The connection was made. Fuel flowed, then they were off again, this time with New York City as their official starting point for the transatlantic record attempt. The Atlantic Ocean at Mach 3 is a blur. Sullivan and Whittefield watched the instruments, making microscopic adjustments, monitoring engine temperatures that would vaporize any normal aircraft. Outside, the sky faded from blue to violet to almost black. At their altitude, you could see the curvature of the Earth. You could see stars in the middle of the day. The aircraft's skin was heating up, expanding, sealing those fuel leaks. Inside the cockpit, it was hot despite the environmental systems working overtime. The air smelled like hot metal and jet fuel. Every sense was heightened, every moment demanded total focus. Below them, somewhere in the North Atlantic, ships were crawling across the ocean, their crews completely unaware that two men were passing overhead at speeds that bent the limits of physics. Then came the second refueling, somewhere over the cold waters between Iceland and Britain. Another perfect connection, more fuel, the final push. The British coastline appeared on their instruments before they could see it with their eyes. Sullivan began the descent procedure, slowing down, dropping altitude, bringing this screaming monster of an aircraft back to something approaching normal speeds. When they touched down at RAF Mildenhall, the landing gear kissed the runway with surprising grace. One hour and 54 minutes and 56 seconds from New York to London. They had just crossed the Atlantic faster than anyone in history. The average speed, 1,806.96 miles per hour. Mach 2.68. Commercial flights today take about seven hours to make the same journey. The Concorde, which was considered revolutionary, took around three hours. Sullivan and Whittefield had just done it in under two. But here is the thing about the SR-71 that makes it truly legendary. That September record was impressive, but it wasn't even close to what the Blackbird could really do. 
That flight was carefully planned, monitored, and executed within specific parameters. It was designed to be repeatable and public. But when SR-71 pilots talk about what that aircraft could actually do when pushed to its absolute limits, the stories get even more insane. There's a famous story about an SR-71 flying over Libya in 1986. The aircraft had been detected and the Libyans fired surface-to-air missiles at it. The pilot's response, he didn't dodge, he didn't weave. He just pushed the throttles forward and accelerated. The missiles couldn't catch up. They ran out of fuel and fell into the desert while the Blackbird disappeared over the horizon. During its operational life, the SR-71 was fired upon over a thousand times. Not a single one was ever hit. Not once. Think about that level of superiority. Enemy forces could see it coming. They knew it was there. They could fire everything they had at it, and it didn't matter. The Blackbird was simply untouchable. The official top speed of the SR-71 is listed as Mach 3.3, or about 2,200 miles per hour. But pilots who flew it will tell you, with knowing smiles, that the real number is classified. The instruments only went up to Mach 3.3. What happened when you pushed past that? Well, those records are still locked away. There is a persistent rumor among aviation enthusiasts and former crew members that the SR-71 could hit Mach 3.5 or even higher in the right conditions. Some say it could reach the edge of space. The official altitude ceiling is 85,000 feet, but again, pilots hint at higher numbers with the same secretive smiles. One pilot, Brian Schul, told a story about being asked by air traffic control how fast his SR-71 was going. Operating an SR-71 was phenomenally expensive. Each flight are required hundreds of hours of maintenance. The specialized fuel, JP-7, had to be manufactured separately and cost a fortune. The support infrastructure, the tankers, the ground crews, the specialized tools required massive resources. And it was dangerous. 12 SR-71s were lost during the program's lifetime. Though remarkably, only one crew member was killed in those accidents. The aircraft pushed human and mechanical limits in ways that would eventually exact a toll. Pilots faced intense physical stress, the sustained high G turns, the extreme temperatures, the long hours in a pressure suit it wore on them. Some developed health issues later in life that they attributed to their time in the cockpit. There was also the psychological pressure. These men were flying missions over hostile territory, knowing that if something went wrong, if the engines failed, if a system malfunctioned, they were too high and too fast for rescue. Ejection at those speeds and altitudes was possible but terrifying. The wind blast alone could kill you. And yet, to a person, every SR-71 pilot will tell you it was worth it. They describe the aircraft with reverence, almost with love. It wasn't just a machine to them. It was a living thing, a partner in a dance that happened at the edge of the atmosphere. In 1990, the SR-71 program was officially terminated. Then it was briefly brought back in the mid-90s before being permanently retired in 1998. The official reason was cost and the availability of satellite reconnaissance. Why risk pilots when you could get the same intelligence from orbit? But many believe the real reason was different. The SR-71 was retired because something better came along, something even more secret. To this day, aviation researchers and military watchers speculate about what replaced it. Was it the Aurora, the RQ-180? Something else entirely, the truth is we probably won't know for another 20 or 30 years. That's how these programs work. By the time the public learns about them, they've been operational for decades. What we do know is that the Senior 71's retirement marked the end of an era. It was the last of the great man spy planes, the last aircraft that required human courage and skill at the absolute bleeding edge of flight. Today, you can see SR-71s in museums across the country. The Smithsonian has one. 
There's one at the Air Force Museum in Ohio. The California Science Center has the one that set the coast to coast speed record Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in 60 for minutes. They sit there, black and silent and still somehow menacing, while families walk around them taking pictures. Kids press their faces against the ropes, trying to see into the cockpit, and it's impossible not to feel something standing next to one of these machines. Because when you look at an SR-71, you're not just looking at an aircraft. You're looking at what humans can achieve when we refuse to accept limitations. When we look at the impossible and say, watch this, September 1st, 1974, 50 years ago, Major James Sullivan and Captain Noel Whittefield flew from New York to London in one hour and 54 minutes. That record still stands. 50 years of technological advancement. 50 years of faster computers, better materials, more powerful engines, and nobody has beaten it. Not because we can't, but because we haven't built anything that can. The SR-71 represents something profound about human achievement. It reminds us that sometimes, in rare moments, we create something so far ahead of its time that it remains unmatched for generations. Think about the engineers who designed it, working with slide rules and pencils. Think about the pilots who flew it, pushing themselves and their machine to limits that still seem impossible. Think about the fact that this aircraft, designed in the early 1960s, was still the fastest plane in the world when it was retired in 1998. We live in an age of constant innovation, where last year's technology becomes obsolete overnight, but the SR-71 is different. It's a reminder that true breakthrough innovation doesn't happen often. When it does, it changes everything. The Blackbird flew its last operational mission over 25 years ago, but its legacy lives on in the engineers who were inspired by it, in the pilots who pushed it to its limits, in the record books where that September flight is still written in permanent ink. One hour and 54 minutes, New York to London. 1974, some records aren't meant to be broken. They're meant to show us what's possible when we dare to chase the impossible. The SR-71 Blackbird wasn't just the fastest plane ever built. It was proof that sometimes, just sometimes, we can touch the untouchable. And that September day in 1974, for one hour and 54 minutes, to mend it exactly that. If you found this story incredible, hit that subscribe button. We've got more stories about the machines and moments that changed history. Drop a comment and let me know. What's the most mind-blowing aircraft ever built? And if you want to see what happened when the SR-71 set the Coast to Coast record, check out the video in the description. Until next time, keep looking up. History is full of surprises.